The weekend box office numbers are in, and I'm excited because The Fault in Our Stars was the big winner, Whoa! taking the number one spot with over $48 million, surpassing even the most optimistic projections it had. In the number two spot was Maleficent, taking in $33.5 million, bringing its two-week worldwide total up to over $335 million. In the number three spot was The Edge of Tomorrow, making just over $29 million. And in the number four spot is X-Men Days of Future Past, making 14.7 million, bringing its three week worldwide total to just under $610 million. <sighs> Rounding out the top five is A Million Ways to Die in the West, making just over $7 million, bringing its worldwide total after two weeks up to $50 million. Mary Byer, sell these box office numbers. Oh God, I have so much to say about this. Uh, <laughs> how can I do this quickly? First of all, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna buy it with the disappointment, the note of disappointment I have that Edge of Tomorrow didn't do better because this was one of Tom Cruise's, I think, best reviewed performances in years, and I love him. And I love the fact that this was a sci-fi that was also an offbeat comedic genre film. I wish it had done better. It won the Critics Choice Seal recently, which means that critics loved it. So that's a disappointment. However, I'm gonna buy these numbers. Because Fault in Our Stars, there's two things. Number one, it's a small movie. It is a studio movie. This was done by 20th Century Fox. But it was a $12 million budget. It came out number one and made four times its budget in one weekend, which yeah. is proof that a small movie in a, a season where it's all big tentpole movies can actually do really well and outperform its much bigger films. Edge of Tomorrow was a $175 million budget, made one-sixth of that. So Steven Spielberg, I think it was like a year or two years ago, had a big talk with George Lucas here in Los Angeles, and he said the summer blockbuster studio structure is breaking down. It doesn't work. It's not sustainable. This is proof. So that makes me really happy because I love small movies. I love all movies. I want to see diversity at the box office. So for me, this is very exciting. The second thing about it is obviously this was a female-driven film. There is a huge power in young women moviegoers that people are finally starting to notice. New York Daily News just came out with an article today that said, whereas big budget male oriented action films with stars like Cruise have long ruled the day at North American multiplexes, those movies are increasingly under siege from films ignited by passionate young female moviegoers. So hooray that there is something for those women. Chrysalis. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy that, that there is room at the box office and that you know women came out and young women alarmingly mostly came out with their dollars and said this is what I want to see. That makes me happy because it just means that there's more for everyone, more movies for everyone to love. Schnepp? <clears throat> well, I'm bummed out. I haven't seen either of the three top box office films. I haven't seen Fallen North Stars, I haven't seen Maleficent, and I have not seen Edge of You're Tomorrow. a little busy in Phoenix. Yeah, busy, and then I'm going I'm scrimping off uh, overseas for... Oh, yeah, fantastic. yeah, we're going to mention this. Schnepp's leaving for London tonight. Yeah, for London. For uh, Can't talk about it, but you'll find out You'll soon. find out why Bing soon. Bong, scrambly scramps. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Edge of Tomorrow, I can't wait to see it. I want to see all these films. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I am bummed out. We had talked about Edge of Tomorrow's ad campaign being very similar to John Carter, where it was like confusing and weird and didn't actually show you how cool the movie was. Mm -hmm. So people are avoiding it because they're like, it looks like Oblivion and Matrix. You know what I mean? Because it does, but they're not showing you why it's cool and different in the yeah. ad campaign. So hopefully word of mouth, everyone talking about it, all the critics and people who've gone to see it, the people who went to see it were like, wow, I saw Edge of Tomorrow at Phoenix Comic Con. We're like, it was really good. Like they were surprised that it was good. Yeah. So hopefully that word of mouth will build and you know, hopefully it makes more money next week. But Yeah, overall, i got to sell the numbers, and, and not because of what's number one. Actually, it's really interesting that right now, here we are in the summer movie season, and mm -hmm. the top two films at the box office are female-driven, female-led yeah. films, mm -hmm. which I think is great for the industry as a whole. But, I mean, the disappointment of Edge of Tomorrow. I know. Sad. It is such a good movie. It, it is ridiculously good, and one of the most incompetent, botched, horrible marketing campaigns Ever. And I was actually talking with a, a rep at Warner Brothers last night about this specifically. It's like, look, I love this movie. This movie's great, and I'm going to beat the drum for it. I'm going to try to get as many people to go see as possible because it, it's so good. But you just can't get away. No one was going to go see this movie after these trailers. Do your... Do your this, this is not the end. Yeah, yeah. When you, as soon as you put out a trailer that makes the movie look like it's some sort of existential, you know, you know soaring into the universe of consciousness and you know, <laughs> questioning the meaning of reality, and you yeah. play that stupid music. Not that it's stupid music, but with this trailer, <laughs> it was stupid. Yeah. I mean, it was a dumb-looking film that nobody wanted to see. And then you see the movie, and it's like, 
This is not the same movie from these trailers. This is fun. It's funny. Yeah. It's got great action, and none of that was communicated in the trailers. Why do you think they did that? Why do you think they made that mistake? Because I feel like stupidity. Okay. I'll, I'll mark it up to stupidity. They make a lot of money for being so stupid. Because you know though, what? I don't know. I don't know. If this was the same group that they like. Quite often, these studios will hire you know third party. Yeah people to run these campaigns. I, it has to be the same group that did the Oblivion campaign. Because mm. the, Obliv the Oblivion market, you and I talked right. about this, looked and felt exactly the same yeah. as this pile of garbage. Yep. And the, But listen, put it if you're one of these people who you have not gone to see Edge of Tomorrow because of how bad the trailers look, number one, you're right, the trailers are horrible. But number two, believe this, this movie is awesome. And you will go see it multiple times. Get out and see it. The other thing that you have to sell because of it is Seth MacFarlane's Million Ways to Die in the West. His last film that he directed, Ted, made almost $700 million at the box office. We're in week number two. I'm not quite sure what its North American number is, but its worldwide number is 50. Yeah. So exactly. it's a huge fall off the cliff for that. So that's too bad. I have, because of my schedule this weekend, I also have not seen Fault in Our Stars. Uh, never underestimate wah, a kid's wah. film. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Your never schedule. Never underestimate a kid's film. Never end, uh, underestimate for guys going to see a movie that's based on a toy they grew up with, and never underestimate a film for women that makes them cry. It, those are the three universal rules of films. And uh, clearly this one did went out there and did it. I'm actually really happy for its success. But I have to also point out that beyond it being female-led, female-driven, which is amazing for both of those two films, but bring back the young adult. Like, this was a True. young adult yes. book. This book was written for teenagers, and we've seen so many books adapted into films in the past two years that have done horribly, with the exception of a couple like Hunger Games and Divergent, that this was an amazing adaptation. People showed up in huge numbers, mm -hmm. and it's one that can be loved by not only those teenage girls, but also their parents. And so it's got that great yeah. balance of Hunger Games, and I think that's why it's doing so well. And Word. it proves that you can make movies for the young adult audience that aren't stupid. Yep. If you're yeah. gonna make, you don't have to make Vampire Academy to appeal to young adults. You don't have to make, what, City of Dumb, City of Bones. Come on, <laughs> you don't, have to, you me. don't have to make that to appeal to young adults. You can make something intelligent and smart and well, young adults will love it. John Hughes movies of the 80s. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. spoke to that exact audience, Chris Lee, that you're talking about and they were funny and smart and most importantly, they were relatable. To, the, to this day, teenagers watch The Breakfast Club and can relate even though it was 30 years ago which I think is awesome. So. Hey everyone, if you like this video, click that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It's free and helps you stay up to date with all the latest movie news, as well as our daily AMC Movie Talk Show. Also, make sure that you follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with all of our special promotions, contests, and prize giveaways.